thank you all for coming to this, uh, I think, final talk today in this um, track for using, uh, on using Docker for developers. Um, very, it's, it's great to see a full room uh, on this one this late in the day. Um, the, the topic for today's presentation is about using Docker file. I think it was referenced in at least two or three other breakouts uh, today uh, because this is your uh, Docker file reference deep dive. Um, so it'll be interesting. Uh, the two speakers are both uh, Docker software engineers, uh, Tibor and Sebastian. Uh, they both uh, work for Docker. Uh, Tibor works out of the San Francisco office. Uh, Sebastian work out, works out of the Netherlands. Um, uh, a personal story, I, I, I'm, uh, I don't think I've introduced myself to anybody yet. Uh, I'm Vijay Raghavan. I, I'm, I started at Docker uh, two, three weeks ago, actually. Uh, I came from VMware, uh, a much bigger company uh, with, a, with a similar history, but long ago, uh, to a, what I would call a newer technology company. Uh, to work for Docker, and it's just an exciting, uh, have been, been an exciting uh, move. Uh, Tibor was on my interview panel, and uh, when I came in, uh, he was very clear in expressing to me how important it is that Docker is an open source company, that, that we cared a lot, and, and coming from VMware, it's a, I mean, we do a little bit, but we did a little bit, but it's a different mindset. Uh, to emphasize that uh, the, the, the open source roots of Docker, the company, are extremely important to every employee here. And uh, true to form, Tibor and Sebastian are both uh, contributors to the uh, Mobi, Mobi project, uh, the maintainers on it. Uh, and uh, that, that open source uh, spirit and, uh, is, is very much reflected in the uh, DNA of the company. We, we build everything out in the open. We do some things uh, inside, but obviously, that's where we want to provide uh, more expensive, greater value to our customers. Um, so after, with that introduction, uh, I will let the speakers uh, take over at some point when the technical issues are sorted out. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry about the little technical issues. Um, welcome, welcome to this session. My name is Tibor, and this is Sebastian. And today, we'd like to uh, show you some of the best practices um, when you write Docker files especially in the context of the latest Docker 1809 release. Um, I want you to know it is no, by no means exhaustive, but um, it, it, it's, um, it's, a first, um, it's, it's a first path. So how does this work? It doesn't work. Yes, you. All right, forget the clicker. So obviously, I'm, I'm assuming some of you, most of you know what the Docker file is, but for the sake of completeness, uh, it's basically just a blueprint to build Docker images, and it's very popular. There's over a million Docker files on GitHub, and most likely its popularity is due to its uh, simplicity. It's very simple, uh, easy to understand. So um, I won't go into all the details uh, of, of uh, each Docker file instruction, so I just put a link to the, to the documentation if you're interested. Um, but what I do want to do is, before we get started, uh, I want you to. I want to encourage you to upgrade. Uh, I, I want to encourage you to upgrade our builder uh, in Docker so that we can get the most out of it. Um, so lately, I've been working on BuildKit uh, and integrating it into Docker. So um, BuildKit essentially is a much more modern builder. Uh, it brings you performance improvements and uh, lo lots of new features, some of which we'll talk about at the end. Um, so our intention is to make this default. So right now it's opt-in in 1809, and this is how you can, this is how you can opt in. By, on the client, you can export this environment variable called docker underscore build kit equals one. And if you don't want to do that on multiple clients, you can do so on the daemon with this uh, configuration uh, as shown on the slides. So, um, actually, I'm curious to know, with a raise of hands, can you tell me if you have heard of BuildKit before? Um, can you please raise your hand? Okay. Okay, a couple. Nice. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, I think this is a good reminder. BuildKit today uh, doesn't uh, doesn't work on Windows, so the support for Windows is coming soon. Uh, be before I uh, hand it over to Sebastian, I want to do a quick refresher on uh, 
on, on some of the terms. So started to find a couple of terms here. A, an image essentially is a, is a template for running, uh, for running containers and uh, it references uh, a list of layers. So all an image is really is a, some config and a rootfs and the rootfs is, is itself uh, constituted by multiple layers. So a, a layer is uh, essentially just uh, some changes in, in, the, in the file system, in the rootfs, and that allows Docker images to be, transfer, to, to, be uh, uh, to be transferred, to only transfer, I'm sorry, to only transfer the layers that you don't already have, um, which saves both time and bandwidth. And finally, this coupled with a, a copy and write or, or a union file system, such as Overlay or, or ButterFS or the many of uh, the ones you know, that allows us to have disk, uh, disk usage efficiency. So whereas before you had like, for instance, one VM uh, or, or multiple VMs running, those would use twice as much space. Whereas if the same container is running, it doesn't use twice as much space. So that's the idea. Um, also on build, um, in a very, very high level, uh, what the build does is parses the Docker files and gets a bunch of build steps to, to perform uh, from it. So the build cache allows you to not have to redo some of the steps and, um, and it's, very, it's, very, uh, it's very useful to gain build, um, to, to reduce your build time essentially. And finally, another term here is a build context, which is the local files on the client that the builder can, can access. And with a simple uh, refresher, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Sebastian. Okay, thank you, Tibor. Okay, all right. we're gonna be looking at, uh, at Docker files and how to improve them. And there's some areas uh, that we're gonna be focusing on that is consistency and repeatability of your builds, uh, the build time, because you don't want to wait too long when building your images. Also the image size, because if you deploy your image, uh, you don't want uh, them to take up too much space and time to deploy is important as well. And of course, security and maintainability. We'll start with an example project. Um, it's a basic Java Sprint Hello World app, and there's a bunch of files in there. There's a Docker file. That's a good start, because then we have something to improve. <laughs> there's some documentation that contains a video, uh, and there's the usual things. There's a pom.xml, a source directory, a readme, and there's a target directory, which contains the latest build of the application. So. We're going to be focusing on the Docker file, so let's have a look what's in there. So the Docker file is pretty basic. It starts with the Debian image. It copies the project files into the image. It installs Java and some utilities, and then sets the container's default command. <coughs> this is what's being run if you execute or if you start a container. So what can we improve? Well, one thing, yeah, it just really stands out. That's an easy fix. Let's change this. Um, <laughs> okay, looks like we're okay. So we tried building this image and it took about 58 seconds and produces an image that's 660 megabytes, roughly. So it looks like we have some things to improve. First of all, the order of layers or the order of steps to do in a Docker file because it's important for caching. Uh, this Docker file copies the application files immediately at the start. This means that because caching is based on the previous steps, that whenever something changes in that content, that all the steps after the copy will be invalidated. So the cache will have to be busted and those steps will have to be run again. So as a result, the app get update, app get install will be executed on every file change you have in your, in your project. 
So let's move it to the end so that we can uh, make sure that uh, the, the app get update, app get installed is cached and we don't have to run that every time. So we moved it to the end. Uh, now changing a file will no longer bust the cache of the installing the packages. And we reduced the build time we tried from 58 seconds to one second, which is quite an improvement, but sorry, no more coffee breaks in between. <laughs> there are some things to improve further. Um, so as you saw, we were copying dot. Copy dot means copy every file in the build context to the image. That's usually not the best things to do. First of all, you're gonna be copying everything. Uh, so it takes up more size. Uh, it takes longer to build. But also, it means that every file that changes in that context will again bust the cache. And it's better to be more specific. In this case, we have a project that has a pre-built application, and that's the only thing we need. So let's copy just the application into the container or into the image. And it makes your build faster. It makes your image smaller and it takes less time to build. So that's always a good thing. In this example, before we made this change, if I, for example, changed the README, uh, rebuilding took one and a half seconds. After this, it took only 100, millise 100 uh, milliseconds. So that's quite an improvement. Size went down a bit by a few megabytes, not drastic, but it's an improvement. One thing to take care of is if you're using copy or uh, if you're copying files into your image, some people use add. It's a different command in the Docker file instruction and it does roughly the same, but it has a lot more functionality. For example, add allows you to copy files from remote sources. Uh, it also extracts files uh, if, you're, uh, if you have a, a zip or a tar GT. And that's something you don't want. Uh, possibly the jar will even be extracted because it is an archive. So if you don't need all the magic of the add command, just use copy. So we optimize the Docker file for caching. Um, the rebuild times are good, but sometimes caching is not what you want. You want to be more specific uh, what to cache and what not. In this case, these two lines, so the app get update and app get install are two separate lines in the Docker file. This is great because it will be cached, but it also means that whenever I want to install a new package into my Docker file, the app get update with gets the package cache is never updated. So it's possible that after some time I add a new package and it's actually installing an outdated package. So identify which things should be combined when breaking the cache and when caching. In this case, we want to combine them. So you combine the app get update and app get install to a single run instruction. This means that whenever you add a package, the line changes and the app get update and the app get install get run both at the same time and the cache will be busted in that case only. The build will take slightly longer to run if you're rebuilding the image, but in the end you have your cache. So the second time it will make no difference whatsoever. <laughs> So yeah, we combine this, we optimize this, but now let's have a look what packages are actually installed because do we need everything that's in this image? In this case, the image set install SSH and Vim. Why do we actually need it? They are debugging tools and you should consider your container to be immutable. Uh, don't ship your debugging tools in your container uh, because it's not what you want. If you need the debugging tools, you can still docker exec into a container if there is really a critical issue. But overall, um, the container should be immutable, so don't ship them. This reduces the size of your uh, image, uh, but it also 
causes a bigger attack factor because now people could remote, get remote access to your container. You don't want that. So with all these changes, we removed unnecessary packages, we reduced the size of the image, and we improved the speed of the initial build. Uh, there's some tweaks we can still make here. First of all, it's a, it's a nice little, little trick, and use the no install recommends option. Um, this makes sure when you app get install something, no unnecessary dependencies will be installed because you don't need them most of the time. Um, so don't install them, don't install what you don't need. Keep it small. And while we're at it, we can even optimize it slightly more because now that the app got update and install are one single unit, after we've finished installing these packages, we no longer need the cache of the package manager. So we can remove those files as we don't need them at runtime as well. So let's have a look. We optimized the Docker file. We got rid of unneeded packages and the package manager cache. We optimized the ordering of the instructions, but the Docker file has become a bit more complex now. Um, we want it to be easy to maintain. And looking at this, we're likely not the only, only person in the world that's installing Java inside an, a Debian container, right? So there should be a better way. And yes, there is. Because there are official images on Docker Hub and most of those do all the steps you want to do, and they are developed especially for using containers, and they have all the best practices already applied. So why not just pick the official image? As an extra advantage, it reduces your time spent on maintenance. Uh, it reduces the size because you may have different projects running Java different images, and if they use the same base image, you will only have to pull that base image once, and they can all share the same layers. And as I said, they are pre-configured to use for containers. They are built by smart people. <laughs> and as a bonus, you can also view on GitHub or, or on, on Docker Hub <laughs> um, if your uh, official image has possible vulnerabilities. So you can decide to pick a different version or at least be aware that there is an issue. So now we switch to the official OpenJDK image and it's only three lines now, a Docker file. So it looks great, uh, but we are not very specific because we're using the OpenJDK image, but what version do we get? If you don't specify a version, don't specify a tag, the latest tag will be used and that's not best practice because what's Latest today won't be latest tomorrow, so you wanna be specific. In this case, we pick version eight because that's what we started with. And yeah, so we, we are pinning to the latest patch release of eight and we will still get patches and updates, but don't bump to uh, a newer major release. Okay, we switched to version eight but can we do better? Yes. Uh, if you have a look at Docker Hub, there's a whole bunch of tags, usually for the official images. And those have a description in the readme, and they describe what version you can use and what <coughs> variants there are. So maybe there's better versions that we can use. In this case, we only wanted the runtime. So instead of using version eight, we use the JRE version, which, which only contains the runtime, Image is smaller, only ship what you need. We can even do better. <laughs> There's variants that are smaller in size. For example, there is a slim variant which installs the headless package of OpenJDK, doesn't ship all the UI related stuff, is considered to be smaller. And even smaller if you pick the Alpine version, which is based on Alpine Linux which is a very minimal Linux version, and it's pretty much a good choice for uh, containers. There are some exceptions which you may be running into, so always 
check if it works for your use case. Looking at the changes, we reduced the image by 540 megabytes by switching just the base image. That's a big game to be had. But we now optimized for uh, caching. Uh, we're copying only what we need. We switched an official image and reduced its size and get all those best practices out of the box. But is it reproducible? Because how does this app get built? I have no idea. I had a look at a readme and it gave some instructions, but I'm copying a random application into my image. And if I need to tell someone how to build it, and they need to build it themselves, install all the stuff. So why not build it as part of the whole process? Create a consistent build environment, and you can describe it in your Docker file, and then basically someone can run that Docker file, build it, and have all the stuff that they need. You have the right versions of the tools you need, and it's, it's a real blueprint of your image. So to do this, we switch from the OpenJDK image to the Maven image. And Maven is a build tool for Java, in case you didn't know. And we still picked the Alpine version, so it's still small. And there's a couple of other changes in there. Uh, first of all, uh, we add the pom.xml, which says which dependencies Java needs. Um, the next line copies the source code in there. And Finally, the application is built and the default command is set again. We can simplify it a bit by reducing all the duplicated stuff. We can use the work there uh, command to uh, set the default, app, default directory, which, change it, which, which makes us no longer set, uh, change to the right directory and set the output path. And we're almost getting there, but we notice that running this again will get all the dependencies again. So to cache those, we split fetching the dependencies to a different uh, run. This will make sure that the dependencies are cached and the next run or the next build will be considerably faster. Doing this is quite a common pattern. It's not just for Java, it's for different uh, programming languages as well. Just for uh, NPM, there's a package.json. For, uh, for pip, there's a requirements.txt. So if you're using a different language, you can use the same technique uh, in your Docker file to improve your caching. Now that we're building consistently, uh, we reduce on size because Right now, we're shipping the build tools again, and that's not what you want. You don't want to be deploying those. So we don't want these in the final image. We only want to ship the application in the end. <coughs> so what's the solution? And I'm going to hand over to Tibor again. He's going to be talking about multi-stage builds. Thank you, Sebastian. So, now we may have a consistent build environment uh, uh, where we compile our source code uh, in a container as the environment, but our image right now is really bloated. It has all the build time dependencies. Um, so the go-to solution in this case is really to use multi-stage uh, in the following way. Um, so first of all, why do we say multi-stage? We say multi-stage because you see multiple from lines. That's how you know how many stages you have is by the number of from uh, lines you have. Uh, first of all, you see a, uh, the as um, builder part at the very top. So that allows you to name the, the, that stage. Um, so in this case, we name the first stage, we name it builder because that's where we build our application. Uh, then there's a second stage at the bottom, uh, which is uh, our, our runtime, uh, our final image, which should be minimal. So, so we start with, again, that open JDK image. Uh, and then what we want to do is we want to copy over the build artifact from the builder stage into our runtime stage, our final stage. And to do that, we use 
the usual copy uh, command, but with a slight variation in the syntax where you have this dash dash from flag. Um, and what this dash dash from flag does is that if you specify the stage, in this case you named it builder, we named it builder, so that's, that's how uh, the two stages are bridged essentially. Um, so what that dash dash from flag does is that the source component of the copy command will be the source in the builder stage. And so in, in this case, we, we, we copy that jar into our runtime image and we, al we also have to add that, um, CMD, that CMD line because we want that to be in the final image to tell what, what the user should be, um, what the container should be running when the user runs the container. Um, so again, this is applicable to other languages as well. The, the pattern always is you have your build environment and then in a separate stage you create your runtime environment with as little uh, dependencies as you need only for the runtime. And then you use copy dash dash from your builder stage to copy over the needed artifacts. Um, so this was one example of multi-stage, and it's probably a very useful one and a common one. But I wanna emphasize one thing, is that there are many other options for multi-stage. And to give you an idea, like for instance, on, in the Mobi project, we have, uh, we have like 16 stages. And in the BuildKit project, we have, I think, 44 stages. So how, how, did, we, how did we get there? How can you have that many stages when, when uh, one of the obvious use cases that I showed you earlier is just to um, get rid of your build time dependencies. So there's a bunch of, bunch of things you can do with multi-stage. So the first one, which you already saw, is to separate the build and the runtime environment, uh, which allows you to shrink the image size, right? Uh, another one is to do slight variations on images, uh, also the, the re refactoring some of the some parts of your Docker file, if, if you, it's more maintainable. Um, um, also, it allows you to have different build tests, uh, bu sorry, different environments like build, <laughs> for, for build, for dev, for test. Um, con con different, uh, sorry, concurrent stages as well, which uh, I'll show you later, and platform-specific stages. So I just wrote a couple of, uh, couple of um, use cases for multi-stage here to give you an idea of, of um, all the things. So here's, uh, here's, I think, one of the examples I listed there, which is if you want to have multiple flavors of your image. So what we do here is um, we, we create a, so so far we had a Alpine-based runtime image, right? It was based on OP, OpenJDK 8, GARE, Alpine, and maybe that works for most of the cases, but say you want, you want that flavor, you, you want a uh, Debian Jesse flavor. So um, in, in order to do that, you create a new stage uh, with, um, based on the J, uh, OpenJDK AJRA uh, Jesse, I'm sorry. And, um, and in order to, to execute, to build only that target, you do docker build dash dash target and the name of your stage. In this case, release Jesse. Uh, if you want to build Alpine, you do release Alpine. And by default, if you don't specify a target, it builds the last, the last stage in the Docker file. So I'll have to uh, hurry up here. So this is just to show that you have some uh, repetition here that you can, uh, you can uh, fix with a global arg. So the way you do this is you add the arg um, instruction at the very, very top of your Docker file. Um, uh, and uh, you, it's, ver it's advisable to always put a default value there. So here, um, you can use that flavor equals Alpine uh, argument um, to replace the, the flavor variable in, in one of the stages, in the, in the last stage there. So this way, when you build with build arg, Alpine equals Jesse, it will it will do. Uh, it, it will do. Uh, it will build from the Debian Jesse image. Um, so this is just to show various environments. So if if you want to uh, lint your code, you you don't necessarily need all the. You don't you don't need all the all the build environment. All you really need is just your code and a linter. 
So again, it's just what you need, a short, uh, a short, um, a short stage for the linter. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to uh, speed up here. So um, the, an example of a dev environment is, is if you want to uh, if, if you want to test your, your your build artifact, see if it works fine, debug it. So you install all the all the dependencies for that purpose for debugging for 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 develop for development. Um, this one is for testing. Uh, so far, uh, we've been test we every time you do MVN package. Maven, this is a Maven specific thing, but it will also run the tests. So if you don't want to run the tests, you have to specify skip tests in this, in this example. Uh, but you can have a unit test specific stage, which would actually only run the tests. Um, and that you can inherit from the builder stage, right? Um, so that you have, so that you have all your, uh, so that you have your uh, application package there. And finally, um, uh, you can also have a specific for a specific stage for integration tests, um, where where you take your final application from the release stage, and and you can test it with, uh, in this case, curl, but anything that suits the integration test. Um, so unfortunately, I won't be able to demo this, but I. So this is one way you could. Uh, I wanted to show how to build concurrently. So so far, the Hello World application was literally just. Uh, showing a hello world on a on a URL, and what I wanted to modify here the application for is to uh, add assets, and those assets are not necessarily needed during during the build time. So, what what I could do here is generate those assets, which would take some time, and and put them in in the in the final release image, again the same way with copy dash dash from. Um, and what it does in this case, if you use BuildKit, is if you build this, um, if you build this Docker file, it will build, it will generate the assets concurrently uh, with the uh, with the with your, with your application compiling. So it's it, it becomes much faster. So because this was a silly hello world example, I wanted to show some of the benchmarks on. Uh, more serious uh, Docker files, like in this case Moby. Um, so, this is comparing the the legacy builder with with the uh, with the new build kit uh, builder. So, in, in this case, um, if you if you start from an empty state, you just do a Docker build, and it's twice faster. Uh, in this case, if you re if you do a repeated build with it, you didn't change anything, you just do it again, and it uh, hits the cache all the way, it's seven times faster. That's really significant. Um, and now if you, the, the, the most common use case is you modify your code and you rebuild it again and it should cache, it, it should hit the cache uh, most of the time, but it should rebuild uh, your source code. And in this case, it's two and a half times faster. So if I have some time, I'd like to go through some of the new Dockerfile features in 1809. Um, most, most of the new features will be in the Black Belt talk tomorrow at 12 p.m. Uh, called Supercharged Docker Build with BuildKit. So if you're really interested, I highly encourage you to go there. Uh, we'll cover what's new and a couple of features that I listed here. Um, so one important thing to know about these new features is that you need to add this line at the very top. This line being pound syntax equals docker slash docker file colon 1.0 dash experimental. Um, so this, wa this will enable uh, the following features. Um, so context mounts. So why do, why do you need mounts? Uh, so there are cases you need certain, uh, certain files, but you don't, you, don't want to, you, don't, you don't want them to be in any layer. Um, so for instance, in the source code, uh, when, you, when you compile your application, is only needed during compilation and doesn't always need to be, uh, to be in a layer. So instead of doing that copy operation, which writes to disk, um, we're simply just bind mounting, and it's read only by default. So uh, we're bind mounting. I'm sorry, we're bind mounting the context, the build context, into the container, and only for that specified run command. Uh, and after that run command is done, there is no source code. Uh, 
there's, well, there's no source code in, in, in that layer. Uh, but we still have our, our uh, app.jar artifact. Um, so, yeah, there's a specific thing here where you need to, you need to put the uh, artifact in a different folder than the folder that you bind mounted. So that's why we have to specify to Maven that the output directory is, is, is not the current one. Um, this one is a big one, so I, I want to share it real quick. Uh, it's the application cache. Uh, what this allows you to do is specify a folder which will be bind mounted from the host every time you build it again. This is super useful for application cache like the Maven cache, like uh, .m2 cache folder. It's also very useful for the APT uh, or any package manager uh, cache. So anything that's caching at the application level uh, you can you can you can use this uh, this uh, type equals cache mount syntax. Um, <laughs> you should never rely on that folder to be there and to be populated. It's just uh, uh, it, it just faster when it's there. Um, so real quick, the recap of the improvements. So we went from an inconsistent build dev test environment with a highly bloated image slow build and in slow incremental builds as well because of all the cache busts. And we got to a consistent build dev test environment, minimal image, and super fast, uh, both build time and incremental build time. If you are interested in, in these things, you want to you wanna read more on some of these blog posts by Tonis, who, uh, who uh, started the BuildKit project, um, one on multi-stage and the other on SSH and secrets which is uh, very exciting because we've been waiting for build secrets for a long time. And um, I think that will be it. So if there's two takeaways from this talk is multi-stage, 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 and please enable build kit. And if you have time or if uh, you want to, you can check out that uh, black belt talk tomorrow. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.